Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining. On today's show, there's a few things I want to talk about. One of them is the reclosing of the economy. So we've heard about the reopening of the economy. That's what a lot of this positive sentiment has been built on. People think that the economy is going to reopen. I'm one of those people that think it's going to be reopened. Well, now we're hearing about the closing of the economy. We hear news like this from the Wall Street Journal. Apple closes retail stores in four states as the coronavirus cases rise. This caused the market to have a little bit of a sell-off, Apple closing back down stores. They're kind of a leader in business. A lot of businesses will follow suit if Apple does something. Well, them closing down stores is definitely a negative sentiment towards the reopening of the economy. So I want to discuss this. We'll look at the coronavirus and see what's going on. And then we have an update on the previous episode I did. I did my previous episode on the company Hertz. This is a bankrupt, failed company that is no way going to meet its obligations. It owes a lot more money than it currently has, and it was trying to pretty much crowdfund its bankruptcy through issuing new shares. I titled the episode, The Insanity of Investing in Hertz Stock, and I don't think that that was a clickbait title. I don't think it was exaggerating. I think it was a very accurate description of what Hertz is trying to do. It's an insane proposition to try to sell stock of a bankrupt company to fund your bankruptcy. That's a pretty insane proposition. Well, we got an update from this. Apparently, the SEC also believes that that's an insane proposition because after they looked into this, Hertz has decided that it's going to cancel the stock sale. So uh, we'll be looking at this, what these companies are trying to do. I think it brings up an interesting discussion of, of what you need to protect yourself against as an investor. So we'll be taking a look at this. And then we have another story I feel is important to talk about. This has been sent to me by multiple people. This Robin Hood trader, he's 20 years old, his name is Alex Kearns, and he took his own life after seeing a negative balance of $700,000 on his Robin Hood account. So he believed he lost like $730,000, and this caused so much stress or anxiety and depression uh, culminating from this destruction, this financial destruction of his life, that he decided to take his own life as a, a result of it. So uh, this is obviously a tragic thing. I think it's important to talk about it, so I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on this as well. So let's go ahead and jump right in. First of all, I want to take a look at my portfolio. It's at a value of almost $100,000, so it was above $100,000, and then we had a couple days where we traded down a bit. Now we're below it again, which means I'm going to be able to pass a $100,000 value not once but twice. So I can be like President Trump celebrating the Dow Jones passing 25,000 three or four times. That might be what happens with my portfolio. But regardless, the main focus really isn't the total value as much as building a reliable stream of passive income. The basic strategy is picking out companies that I think have different characteristics. They're high quality companies that have moats, they have predictable, reliable cash flow. And with that cash flow, they give a certain amount to shareholders on a routine basis. They do that in the form of a dividend. That's what a dividend is. As a company looks at its balance sheet, they say, you know, we have a lot of money. We have enough money to reinvest back into our company. We have enough money to pay out our employees. We have enough money to do research and development and do capital expenditure and expand. And then we have a lot of money beyond that. What can we do with that money beyond that? We can reward our shareholders. That's what a dividend is. Is it's excess cash beyond the money that a company needs to operate given out to shareholders. Because in some companies, they're so profitable, they're so successful that the money is not a bottleneck. They don't need all the money they have to be able to run their business and expand their business. So those are the type of companies that I look for. Ones with highly predictable streams of cash flow. That cash flow gets paid out to shareholders as a reward, and that's in the form of a dividend. I gather up these dividends and I use it in combination with my income to purchase more companies. And there you get a little bit of compounding effect. So that's the basis of the strategy. Part of it is trying to identify companies that not only pay dividends, but they have other characteristics. I own a total of 43 companies. That's how many I have in my portfolio. There are thousands of companies that pay dividends. So the dividend is not the only thing I look at. I look at other characteristics and I try to form a portfolio that's really resilient, that has companies that are scalable, that they can continue to pay dividends well into the future. So I want to go through my portfolio and take a look at one of the common criticisms that you get as a dividend investor. If you are selecting dividends and you go and discuss it anywhere online, there's going to be somebody that typically is a critic of dividend investing that will say something to the extent of, there's no point in focusing on dividend companies because during a recession or a pandemic, all those companies are going to cut their dividends anyways. They're going to stop paying out shareholders. 
That's the type of thing you'll hear. Well, we're actually in an environment right now where we can test that out. The people making those claims that these companies will cut their dividends, we can take a look right now. We're in a pandemic. We're in a recession. We've had a government mandated shutdown. We can look at how many companies have actually cut their dividends in my portfolio. So I thought this would be interesting to look at. I want to go through sector by sector and simply take a look at that criticism. See if it's valid. See if we're seeing widespread dividend cuts in my portfolio. Now, like I said, I own 43 companies. I'll go through each sector one by one, and we can take a look at how many have cut their dividends. In real estate, we have one that I've sold out of NRZ. That one has cut its dividend by 90%. So I sold out of NRZ. There was other reasons as well. It was a company that has a really complex business strategy. I really didn't want to follow along with it. So I sold out of NRZ. Other than that, we really haven't had any dividend cuts. The only other one was a reduction by 30%. Well Tower reduced the dividends that they're paying by 30%. But that's it. So out of six companies, two in real estate have cut their dividend. And real estate is one of the hardest hit sectors from the pandemic. Simon Property might cut theirs in the future. There's a lot of people predicting like a 50% dividend cut sometime within the next two weeks. So we'll see. But again, out of six companies so far confirmed, two companies have reduced their dividends and one by only 30%. Not too bad. If we go into consumer, this is the second biggest portion of my portfolio. We have what, nine companies here? Out of the nine companies, two have announced dividend suspensions. These are temporary suspensions because their businesses are mostly closed and they plan on reinstating their dividend once their businesses open back up. One of them is Estee Lauder, which sells makeup. It's a beauty company. It's definitely doing okay. They just wanted to temporarily suspend their dividend because most of the stores like malls and Ulta Beauty and these companies that sell their products are closed right now. So they're just saying, hey, investors, we're not really making a whole lot of money right now because our stores are closed. Wait till they open back up and we'll continue paying the dividend. That's what Estee Lauder is doing. Right now they have temporarily suspended the dividend. This is a minor holding. So this really isn't a huge reduction in cash flow for me. The other one is Disney. Like Estee Lauder, this company has had a significant portion of its business closed. They've had the closure of parks, of cruise lines. They've had the closure of movie theaters, which they sell their movies in. So this has had a lot of cash flow reduction. And I think that Disney has announced the dividend suspension for two reasons. One of them is because of the financial situation. They might want to make their balance sheet a little bit stronger. But I think the bigger reason is because of political public relation reasons. They don't want to have a bad image. Disney can afford to pay their dividend. They could be paying their dividend out right now and be just fine. I think a big part of the reason they're not paying their dividend is simply because it looks bad to pay out the greedy shareholders while they're furloughing employees. That just doesn't give off a good image. So Disney, kind of out of obligation of, of keeping a good public image, has announced a dividend suspension, but this company is in fine financial condition. So I expect that they'll continue to pay their dividend once they get employees back to work, once they open back up theaters and their parks. So out of real estate, we have two companies out of six. Out of consumer, we have two out of nine. Next up, we have healthcare. Healthcare is easy because no company has announced dividend cuts or suspensions. A lot of them have announced dividend increases. So most of these companies are increasing the amount they're paying in dividends. Just the opposite of what we're expecting during the pandemic, when everybody's going to cut their dividends, all these healthcare companies are increasing the amount they're paying their shareholders. We can take a look at finance. Surely this is a sector that's going to be affected by the pandemic. We have lots of banks and companies that lend out money. Don't you think that these are going to be affected? So far, none of them have cut their dividends. All these banks have continued to pay out shareholders. Their balance sheets are fine. Main Street Capital is the only one that's semi-close probably to a dividend cut because they pay out a really high yield, but so far, none of them. Out of the seven companies here, all of them continue to pay out shareholders just fine. So out of healthcare and finance, 14 companies, all of them are paying shareholders business as usual. We can take a look at tech. I have three companies in this one. None of them have cut their dividends. They're all in fine financial condition, and I don't expect any type of dividend cuts from any of them in the future. We can take a look at utilities here. I own four utility companies. These are heavy dividend payers. None of them have announced dividend cuts. They continue to pay out as normal. So we have, let's see, healthcare, finance, tech, and utilities all paying out shareholders as normal. We can go to telecom, AT&T and Verizon. These are both big dividend payers. Both of them continue to pay dividends as normal. So they're not affected. So, so far that makes 
healthcare, finance, tech, utilities, and telecom, none of these companies in these sectors in my portfolio have had their dividends affected at all, except for raising the amount that they're paying to shareholders. That's been the effect, is they're paying me more as a shareholder during this pandemic. Then we can take a look at industrials. This is one where we do have a dividend cut, kind of. We have Boeing, which announced their dividend cut during this pandemic, but Boeing had two planes fall out of the sky. I can't really blame the pandemic on Boeing cutting its dividend. They had a lot of business failings. In fact, I would say just a constant stream of business failings, bad decision, poor management, long before this pandemic that led to their dividend cut. So can we count that or not? I don't really know if that really counts as a dividend cut during this pandemic. I don't really think so. I think Boeing had enough failings beforehand. So these other four companies I have continue to pay dividends, but Boeing is one I sold out of. I lost a couple hundred dollars on that one. Then we can take a look at energy, the very last sector. Even though this sector has been struggling with the low oil prices, who knows how long these oil prices will be low, but regardless, neither of these companies have cut their dividends. So Chevron and ExxonMobil continue to pay dividends. So again, we can look at this out of healthcare and finance, tech, utilities, telecom, industrials, and energy. Only one company has had its dividend affected negatively, which was Boeing, which again, I don't think really counts in terms of this pandemic because they had massive problems before going into the pandemic. Now, the point is I haven't seen this come to fruition. All these warnings about large scale dividend cuts across your portfolio, I really haven't seen that happen with mine. I've seen very modest amounts of damage done from this pandemic. Even if we look at articles like this, there has been warnings for months now that investors that are investing in dividend companies, they're going to see massive amounts of dividend cuts. CNBC says for investors banking on dividends, quote, the pain has just begun. This was written April 15th. That's when it was published, April 15th. So a couple months ago, the pain has just begun. Shouldn't we be in the midst of the pain right now? Yeah, I'm seeing four companies out of 43 cut their dividends, reduce their dividends at all, and most of them are temporary suspensions. That doesn't really seem like a whole lot of pain. In my portfolio, if I go to the past month, I've earned $278 in dividends. That's the past 30 days. If I go to a bigger timeline, the past 90 days, this is throughout this pandemic, I've earned $780 in dividends. That's really close to in line of what I was earning before this pandemic. So I haven't seen this criticism, this warning people give of large scale dividend cuts. I have not seen that with my portfolio. Maybe it will happen sometime in the future. Things can change. Maybe a lot of these companies will start cutting their dividends, but right now it seems to be going really good. So that's my update so far. This portfolio has been resilient. It still continues to pay dividends. This number goes up all the time. I continue to watch the money come in. The capital gains, I was in the green by a few thousand a couple days ago. Now I'm back in the red. It continues to go up and down with the market, but overall I'm building up a steady stream of income and you can see that happen here. Now moving on, I wanna jump into some headlines. The first one here I think is the biggest news of the week. This is something that had a really big impact on the markets, on investor sentiment. The headline from the Wall Street Journal is Apple closes retail stores in four states as coronavirus cases rise. So we have acknowledgement that coronavirus cases are rising. And as a consequence of that, we have retail stores closing. Those are pretty much the biggest fears of investors right now is that the economy is going to close back down. That is the biggest concern, the resurgence of the coronavirus, more businesses shutting down and us going back into quarantine. That's kind of worst case scenario right now. Over the past month, the news has been mostly positive. Businesses are opening back up. We have positive investor sentiment. And this news kind of threw some cold water on it. So if we look at the S&P 500, you can see the impact this had. This story came out late June 9th, and then the market went down about 6% in one day. It's recovered a little bit, but we're still down 3.4%. That's a lot of impact for one piece of news, but Apple's a very large company. They're very influential and they're definitely a trendsetter. If Apple does different changes in their policy like this, where they close down locations, what this does is force other companies to consider doing the same because Apple's closing down these stores and these four states as a way of saying, we think it's somewhat irresponsible to keep them open. So for the safety of our guests, for the safety of our employees, we're closing them down. And that's fine for Apple. But what that also says by implication is that other retailers in those same states, by implication, you are being irresponsible if you remain open. That's what they're saying, that we're going to close down because we're being responsible and other companies that remain open simply don't care as much. So 
That's what other companies have to fight with, is they have to say, well, Apple's doing this. This might look bad if we remain open. And so they might close down, even though they really wouldn't have plans to otherwise. There's an immense amount of social pressure that goes on with these different companies' policies. If Apple closes down stores, that puts a lot of pressure on other companies to follow suit. So that's what's going on right here. I feel like this could cause the same type of chain reaction where a lot of companies follow suit with Apple and they close down their retail shops until Apple decides to open back up. Now, there's a difference between Apple in this situation and other companies. Apple is a massive company. They make a lot of money from app sales, from music sales, a lot of digital products, and they can sell their phones online. Closing down their retail stores really doesn't affect them all that much. So this isn't really a huge sacrifice for Apple. It's a way to make them look really responsible without affecting their bottom line that much. For other retailers, where the majority of their money is made from their retail locations, it is a huge impact on their bottom line to close their stores. It could potentially put them out of business. So Apple has the luxury of doing this and having an abundance of caution. A lot of other companies are in a much tighter situation. Apple gives the reason they're doing this. They say, quote, we take this step with an abundance of caution. As we closely monitor the situation, we look forward to having our teams and customers back as soon as possible. So they're saying they're doing it out of an abundance of caution. Again, Apple has the luxury of doing that without too much sacrifice. So they can close things down, doesn't really affect them too much. It also says here that the stores that are being closed are across four different states right now. It's 11 different stores, two in North Carolina, one near South Carolina, two in Florida, and six in Arizona. So these four states where they're gonna be closed, I think it's gonna continue on in other states as well. The first graph we can look at is new daily cases of the entire United States. So this is everything. You can see the downward trend for a couple months it was going down. This is when we were all closed in quarantine. And then about a month ago when things really started to open back up, you can see the resurgence of cases. The new daily cases is starting to spike back up where it went from about 17,000, 20,000 new cases a day. That's when it was getting pretty low. Now we're back up to 31,000 cases a day. That's the last recorded day. So we're seeing the spike. If we go state by state, there's a couple areas where it's really gone up. In North Carolina, you can look at the trend. They're having something like 200 to 300 cases a day. And then the last week, they've been having 1,500 cases. This is one state that Apple has closed its stores. The next one was South Carolina. Again, they have 100 cases a day, 200 a day. And then the last week, it's been over 500 cases a day. So it's been going up in South Carolina. And then in Florida, this is another place that Apple closed its stores. We see it pretty flat for quite a while, 500 cases a day. And then the cases started to go up quite a bit. 3,000 a day, 3,800 a day. The last recorded day was 4,000 cases. So it's gone up dramatically in Florida. Then we have Arizona. This is another one where it was only a couple hundred cases a day. And then it started going up to like 1,000. We had a couple days where it's over 1,000, 2,600. And then the last recorded day is 6,000. That's a spike of like five times. So this is a pretty huge spike in Arizona. Then we have Texas, another state where it's been flat for months, about 800 cases a day, 600 to 1,000. It's about what it was averaging. And then over the past couple months, it's been rising dramatically. The last recorded day was 4,400. So a huge spike in cases in Texas. We have Oregon. You can see the same trend, a spike in cases last month. We have California, which is also gradually trending in the wrong direction. So now I could continue giving examples of this. We could go state by state and look at them, but the trend is basically the same. The amount of coronavirus cases has increased over the past month. That's basically the data. We've seen a pretty significant increase over the past couple weeks in new cases. So there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns, but I'm still on the side where I think that things, generally speaking, are going to be opening back up. The economy is still going to be opening back up. We'll have setbacks like this where Apple closes stores. There's going to be some states that have spikes in cases, but I think it will be dealt with on a more individual case-by-case -case basis, where certain states shut down certain parts for a certain amount of time, not another nationwide shutdown. We have news like this from the Treasury Secretary saying, quote, we can't shut down the economy again. He says that it's not feasible. That's something I don't think our economy can go through again. We spent nearly $5 trillion in a couple months with this shutdown. A lot of these companies have been given lifelines by Jerome Powell, but they can't continue to live this way forever. These companies have to operate by themselves. So I think that generally speaking, things are going to continue to open back up. From what I can see on social media, what I see outside is people are becoming less fearful of the coronavirus. So we'll see what happens, but I think that we're seeing people wanting to resume business. Okay, now moving on, I want to do a follow-up of the previous episode I did. The title of it was The Insanity of Investing in Hurt Stock. 
I looked at this company, Hertz, which is a car rental company. They declared bankruptcy. They're completely insolvent. They owe billions of dollars to creditors and they have no money to pay it. And something I thought was interesting was hundreds of thousands of Robinhood investors were buying shares of this company after they declared bankruptcy. After they publicly stated they can't pay back their creditors, people are wanting to buy shares of this company. So I thought that that was a little odd in and of itself. But then Hertz's whole plan to get out of this bankruptcy was even more crazy. They were going to issue new shares to shareholders to fund their bankruptcy. So pretty much they're selling stock in their company. They're going to take that money and give it straight to creditors. That's a really insane situation. That's why I put it as the title. Now, just a follow up of that. That was on the 16th. Let's go ahead and look at news that happened one day later. Here is Jay Clayton, the SEC chairman, talking about Hertz's plan to sell this new stock. And um, what I can say is that in this particular situation, we, we have let the company know that we have comments on their disclosure. Um, in most cases, when you let a company know that the SEC has comments on their disclosure, um, they do not go forward until those comments uh, are resolved. So the SEC came in and said that we have comments on the disclosure, which apparently comments on the disclosure means we're looking at your proposal to sell this new stock, and we want you to address a few things before moving forward with it. That's what the SEC is saying. Now, after news broke that the SEC was looking at this, they actually halted trading on the stock. So you couldn't buy Hertz stock or sell it for the entire day on the 17th. And then a day later, we hear news that bankrupt company Hertz terminates its plan to have the stock sale. So there's the end of it. They're no longer going to crowdfund their bankruptcy. So this, of course, makes perfect sense. The SEC should not let Hertz sell stock to pay back creditors. That's not something that they should do. A lot of people that have no clue what they're doing are being protected by the SEC. You have to know that issuing new stock is a little bit like an IPO. It's a company saying we're wanting to sell some of our company. That's exactly what an IPO is. You have a private company they choose to sell a portion of it to the public. And to be able to IPO, a company has to go through a lot of different red tape. They have to do a lot of different accounting. The public has to know everything about that company financially, all of its plans, all of the proper disclosures. The SEC would never let a company IPO if it was bankrupt and owned creditors billions of dollars. They would never allow that IPO. So they should also never allow a company in existence right now that's completely bankrupt to sell new stock to shareholders. That's essentially trying to do the same thing. I think that the SEC did exactly what they should do, which is protect irrational investors from buying worthless stock. So there's your quick follow-up on Hertz. I'm glad, though, I'm not the only one that thought this was a little insane. Now, moving on, the last story I want to talk about is a pretty sad, tragic one. This is a 20-year-old named Alex Kearns who had recently got into investing. He got into finance. He opened an account with Robinhood. That was the first brokerage he opened, and he got into options trading. Now, options trading, for people that don't know, is like the wild, wild west of investing. It's where you go in and you make these bets, and you can either make a lot of money really quickly, or you can lose a lot of money really quickly. I have tried to discourage this as much as possible on my channel. In fact, I have entire videos dedicated to it that have the most views of my entire channel. Like one of them is episode five. It has over 400,000 views. And the title of it is why new investors lose money. All this is, is a montage of people that have lost vast sums of money doing options trading, doing betting. I don't like it because I think that it is, it's something where you're not really investing, you're more gambling and it can have life altering consequences and you see that happening here. Alex Kearns had some of the bets that he made on Robinhood using options go the wrong way. And it was displayed to him on Robinhood that he had a buying power of negative $730,000. So he thought this meant that he owed Robinhood $730,000. There's people that have explained this that understand options really well that point out that it really wasn't settled yet. He probably didn't owe quite that much money. But regardless, Alex thought he owed Robinhood nearly three quarters of a million dollars. He thought that his life was pretty much over. And as a reaction to that, he actually went out and took his own life. So it doesn't say here if he had any type of underlying condition like depression or anything like that. But regardless, this brought such a reaction to him losing this money that he decided to take his own life. Now, I'll share a couple of thoughts on this. The first one, and I think the most important is... No amount of money is worth taking your own life. Not a million dollars, not a billion dollars. I could owe Robin Hood any amounts of money and I would not take my own life. It's just not worth it. Money is something that comes and goes. 
Uh, its value is completely subjective of how much it really is valuable in your life. There's other things that I think are far more valuable, your health being one of them, your relationships, your family, uh, the accomplishments you have, the type of person you are. There's so many things that are more valuable than money. This is one thing that can help improve some parts of your life. So no amount of money is worth having depression or anxiety about. Uh, if people are struggling with that, they should seek help because it's not worth it. Having anxiety over finances isn't worth it. It's not worth it. And this is coming from somebody that I have been in different financial situations. When I was first married, I made maybe $12 an hour. The type of outings that we would do is go pick up Chinese food and come back to my apartment that I paid $400 a month to live in. That was the most extravagant outings that we could do. And we still had fun. That was still a good time. Most of the financial stress we have and anxiety, I think is typically not worth it. It's really not worth it to be stressed about finances, especially the amount we are. The next thing that I'd point out is I'm not sure exactly what was going through Alex's head when this happened, but he left a note that said, quote, how is a 20 year old with no income able to get assigned almost a million dollars worth of leverage? There was no intention to be assigned this much and take this much risk. So this is sad for a couple reasons. He didn't understand the risks he was taking. Part of investing is understanding and controlling for risk. That's something that we should all try to do is not take risks that we don't understand. So that's one thing. But I think more importantly, it seems like he thought that there was no other options. There's no other alternatives. And there's always an alternative. If you're thinking about doing something that harms yourself, realize there's other solutions. There's always other methods, other solutions, ways of dealing with it. It's not as bad as it seems. When you're in financial trouble, it's usually not as bad as it seems. This is the land of second chances. That's what the U.S. is. There's people that go from the worst financial positions ever, and they become millionaires quickly in their life. This is the land of opportunity, the land of second chances. This was not the end of the road for Alex, even financially. So this having happened, I think, is really sad because he thought that this was the door being closed that it was all over. So if I looked at this and I saw that I owe Robin Hood $730,000 and I'm 20 years old with no career, really no income, I'm not paying back a dime of that. I'm not gonna pay back $1 of that money. Normally, I'm not a real advocate of bankruptcy. I think for the most part, people should try to pay back their creditors. But in this case, I think it would be completely justified. Robin Hood has no business extending this type of leverage to a 20 year old. They have no business doing that. And if he really didn't owe that much money, they shouldn't be displaying it on his account that he has that much negative buying power. So I think that this is a tough situation because he thought that he was closed off financially and that his whole financial future was ruined when it really wasn't. This wasn't a situation that he could have worked his way out of. That's something that people go through all the time and you can come out on top of that in a few years. You can repair things financially. So it's just a really sad, unfortunate situation. Robin Hood said that they are deeply saddened to hear the terrible news and that they reached out to share their condolences with the family. They also said that they're gonna be reviewing their app and making any changes that they think are appropriate to try to avoid anything like this happening again. Okay, let's move on and get into some emails. The email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. That's joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com if you'd like to email in. Really anything you have, anything on your mind you want to talk about, email it in and we'll discuss it here. The first one is from Daniel. He says, hi, Joseph. Love your show. Found it after someone recommended it on Facebook and binge watched all the episodes. Could you please discuss what happened to Wirecard? So many people here in Germany got hurt really bad, Daniel. Well, Daniel, I did see a little bit about the Wirecard case come up in the Wall Street Journal and other places, and it is another sad case. So this is a situation where, just to back up a bit, Wirecard is a tech company in Europe, a highly successful tech company in Europe up until recently. And that is important because Europe is struggling to have really successful, innovative new tech companies that are competing with China and the US. That's something they're in desperate need of right now. If you live in the United States, you're really lucky. You're kind of blessed to be around uh, a country that has a lot of innovation in the tech area. We have extremely large cap dominant companies like Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, Google. But then even beyond that, there are hundreds of other companies in the US that aren't mega caps like those ones listed, but they're still really big tech companies, ones that are just below that, even companies that are small like Twitter, which is a really small company in the US 
would be a really big company in terms of tech companies go in Europe. So the U.S. has a lot of these really large tech companies. They are dominant in their industry. They can use their leverage and scale to influence a lot of business, and they're hugely influential on our GDP. So that is kind of the holy grail. That is our our uh, holy grail in the U.S. are these big tech companies. China's the biggest competitor by far. They're the ones that are competing the most with U.S. tech companies. And I think that they do a lot of things that are unfair with the way they compete. Restrictions on our businesses. But regardless, tech is not quite as popular in Europe. This is something that they've struggled with. So you have companies like Wirecard that are competitive, that are growing. This is a good story that Europe wants to get behind. This is something that Germany in particular was really proud of. They have a successful tech company. It was growing at a fast pace. It was competing with other firms. And then you find out, particularly by an audit from KPMG, that they had $2 billion of cash that they could not find. This is a really big auditing firm. I had a friend that worked at KPMG. This is a routine thing they do is they look for where securities are. So if a company says that they own something, they want to find out, do you really own it? That's what they did with all this cash is they went to look for where it actually was and they couldn't find the cash. And KPMG kept looking and finally they come to the conclusion, the cash does not exist. From the Wall Street Journal, it said that Wirecard AG said that more than $2 billion missing from its balance sheet probably doesn't exist. And it's confirmation that its fastest growing online payments business was more of a mirage than a miracle. $2 billion missing. Fabricated. They said that this supports the argument that Wirecard used third parties to make itself look bigger than it actually was. So this is a case of fraud. This was fraud on a very large scale, and it finally became exposed. The stock went from a high of about $110, $111 a share. Now it's trading at $7 a share. So... The stock's obviously plummeted. Same with the market cap. Nobody wants to own this company because when you have $2 billion missing with a company like this, it shows massive amounts of fraud. So I don't know if there's too much you can really do about this. Trying to avoid investing in companies that commit fraud is difficult to do. We don't really have the tools to tell what companies are committing fraud or not. There's a handful of them in Europe that have. There's uh, HSBC that had the whole money laundering fraud. There's Volkswagen that had some emission scandal. But we have a lot of them in the U.S. as well. We have Wells Fargo that was making a lot of fake accounts. We have Enron. We had WorldCom. We have Waste Management that also had a $2 billion fraud. So this type of stuff happens. There's going to be companies that continue to commit fraud. It'll go unchecked for a little bit, and then it will get exposed, and the company's stock price will be reflected in it. So my best advice on this is to diversify. That's one of the things that protects you against is fraud. If you have one company that commits fraud, but it's one of 20 companies in your portfolio, at least you limited the damage. So it's unlikely that if you have 20 plus companies in a portfolio, that half of them are going to be committing fraud. That would be very unlikely. So my only advice on it would be to diversify. And this just is a bummer for Europe. It's a bummer for Germany. This is supposed to be their next great tech company. Germany was taking a lot of pride in this company. They already have SAP. This is going to be the next big tech company, and this is the way that it ends up, which is really unfortunate. We need Europe to have a lot of good companies. We need them to have a lot of tech companies. That's what we need to see as Europe creating a lot of big tech companies that compete with the US. I much rather have an environment and a world where Europe and the US are competing with each other than China and the US. I much rather have competition between Europe and the US because I think that they play on a little bit more of a fair playing field. So so another unfortunate case. Victor says, Dear Joseph, hi from France. Thanks for your show. I started investing at the bottom of the corona crisis, and since then you gave me the inspiration and motivation to carry on. I now have 11 k invested and just passed $35 a month in dividends. I wanted to know how do you reconcile these two principles? Don't try to time the market. Buy good companies at the right price. For instance, I bought a share of Apple for less than $240, I believe this company has a great future, but I'm reluctant to buy more shares at that price. I'll wait for a better opportunity. Doing this, am I timing the market? And don't you do this too? Well, this is a really good question. And reconciling these two things is really difficult. Don't try to time the market and buy companies at the right price. The buying companies at the right price is something you hear preach from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and Howard Marks. Price is really important. The less you pay for a good company, the more chance you have making a lot of money from that purchase. So your future expected return is increased when you pay a lower price. Uh, Your margin of safety is increased when you pay a lower price. So you want to buy with the best deals that you can. 
But then you hear that there's a lot of studies and a lot of data that shows that dollar cost averaging is what builds wealth. Continually putting money into the market, day in and day out, buying stock all the time, people that do that usually become wealthy, even if they aren't the best investors, even if they aren't the ones getting the best deals on everything, people that continually put a large amount of cash flow into assets throughout their life usually end up wealthy. So how do you reconcile these two things? I would say that I do it in this order. I think that dollar cost averaging, I think that that comes first. Getting in the habit of buying stock all the time, I think is the first thing. Because usually if you do that, even if you buy during the highs, you'll also buy during the lows. You're buying stock all the time. That'll usually end up making you wealthy, and if not wealthy, much better off than you would be. So I think the first thing is dollar cost averaging, but then trying to find the best deals that you can when you dollar cost average. So I put money into the market every single week. I do it on up weeks, I do it on down weeks, but what I do with my purchase is I try to target companies I think are the best value of that week. So I do some research, I look at PE ratios, I look at the current dividend yield compared to its five-year history, I look for companies that I think are in scalable markets, they have a chance to grow in price a lot, and I put money into those. Sometimes I overpay, sometimes I underpay, but I'm buying companies all the time, and most of these are gonna be paying me dividends for the next 10 years. So I put first, buying assets all the time, I think that's the highest priority is getting in the habit and the routine of consistently putting money into assets and secondly, buying the best deals that you can. So in the given time period, try to find the best opportunities, the best value that you can. So that's my strategy. That's what I'm doing. Some people might take the opposite approach and they might say, I'm not putting any money in the market until the prices come back down. And that might work out. It might not, but that's not the strategy that I'm following. Okay, I'll do one more email. Hey, Joseph. I am a 19-year-old student living in Sweden and thus not trading with the same market on focus as you are. But I think my question is universal to some extent. My question is, isn't market gains more worth it for me who doesn't trade with several thousand dollars? Stay safe, Leo. Yeah, Leo, this is a common universal question. If you're only working with a really small amount of capital, shouldn't you focus on growth because you have more opportunity to make a lot of money quickly? I think that might be true. If you're only working with a couple hundred dollars and you wanna do something with it, it's not that exciting to put it into Johnson & Johnson. That's more of a strategy if you have a consistent income and a consistent way of funding your portfolio to grow that snowball. But if you're only working with a small amount of money, dividend investing doesn't seem like the most fun thing to do. So I understand that. I think if you wanna do something more exciting with it, you can do some bets on some growth companies. But really looking at your situation, you should focus on the lowest hanging fruit in your financial life. Look at your whole financial sphere and figure out what's gonna make you the most money. In your case, it's clearly increasing your active income. So going to your schooling, focusing on learning a good trade, where you're gonna bring in some income. And then you can focus on doing whatever strategy you want. You're not limited by a small amount of capital because you have a good income that provides good capital to come into your portfolio all the time. So I think right now the major focus should be your schooling. What I would do at the stock market is really look at it more from an educational standpoint. I would look at it like you're just in the learning portion of your life. You're going to university, you're learning these skill sets, and you're learning the stock market at the same time so that when you do have a good income and you're working with good amounts of money, you know what to do with it a little bit better. So that's the attitude I would take. I wouldn't try to focus too much on growing the amount of money you have right now into something big. I think that if you do make really big bets with it, it's likely you're gonna lose it. And if you do invest it in something really conservative, it's not really enough money to grow that big anyways. So I would just look at it from a learning perspective. I would focus on increasing your active income because your schooling and your skill set to bring in a paycheck is by far the lowest hanging fruit. That's where you can benefit the most. That's the bottleneck in your life right now. And then after you have that, it'll be the investing portion. So that would be my advice. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode there. This is episode 100. 100 episodes. I look forward to another 100 episodes. This has been a fun thing. The audience has been growing. The amount of viewership and subscribers. All the metrics on the channel are up. So I appreciate everybody that's been sharing the videos, liking them, all that good stuff. And I will continue to share my portfolio, my thoughts on the daily news and this exciting world we live in. So I will be talking with you guys next time.